The Tom Woods Show, episode 1758. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, I don't know about you, but I am running into a lot of progressives saying, look, police, fire, schools, these are all great examples of socialism. Well, let's focus on that school example. I've got a free ebook called Education Without the State that makes a pretty darn good case for a stateless approach to education. Pick it up at nostateeducation.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here talking to Nick Hudson today of Panda, Pandemics, Data, and Analytics, which he created as a way to get real information out there about what's going on with COVID-19, but also to talk about the consequences of the so-called mitigation measures, the real-world consequences of those, which are nearly always neglected in the kinds of conversations we've been having on the subject. And he wrote to me after hearing my episode with the great Gret Glyer about how lockdowns were devastating the developing world. And uh, we struck up a correspondence, and here we are. So, Nick, welcome. Hi, Tom. How are you? Well, doing well. I'd like to start off with a little bit of your background before we get into the organization. Tell people who you are and how you got involved in this. Well, the who I am person is easy. I'm a, I'm an investor, a private equity investor uh, based in Cape Town. And the how we got involved part is a little more complicated. Uh, we were a bunch of friends looking with a little bit of concern upon the emerging story of COVID um, starting in China, then devouring the Diamond Princess data, as many people did. Another actuary, a lawyer, a doctor, and a data science friend of mine. And we're looking at it from an investment point of view, from a general curiosity point of view, and getting a little unsettled about how the whole thing was being blown up. And as we came to understand the Diamond Princess information, we realized that this wasn't really going to be a big story. And that was half right and half wrong because as it's turned out, as everybody knows now, the actual epidemic has not been a big story, but the reaction to it has been obscene, I would say. And as time went by and South Africa went down the path of many other countries into a a very draconian lockdown, which was meant to be three weeks originally, you know, only three weeks to get the hospitals to prepare. That went through its three weeks, was renewed, and has been renewed every month since. We are now over 200 days of lockdown, an economy destroyed, country in tatters, and we've had you know, a very small epidemic. But the whole story was filled with all the, the usual features that have played out in so many places, overwrought models, Uh, some crazy behavior wherever you look, whether it's in the public sector or the private sector. And as that started ramping up, we decided that something needed to be done. A couple of weeks of sort of anxiety, realizing that this was going to be a very, very bad and destructive story. So we started mobilizing and actually getting a little more serious about this. At the stage, lockdown was very popular in South Africa. Everybody thought it was the, the bee's knees. And um, so it was a very difficult subject to approach without getting your head chopped off immediately. And the regulations that were rolled out included prohibitions on what they referred to as fake news about the epidemic. So we looked at the situation and had to think about how to approach it. And we did so by putting together a paper that we thought addressed a lacuna in the, in the whole approach aimed to assess the, the negative consequences of lockdown. The paper was called Quantifying the Years of Life Lost to Lockdown, and it invoked standard insurance techniques to translate loss of income into mortality consequence. And we published a paper in short order and uh, sent off a letter to the president and the, all his ministers, just pointing out to them that they needed to think carefully before they reacted uh, very strongly. Um, and that we followed up with quite a strong media program. We hired some communications consultants to help us get that out into the, into the public domain. And the rest was a bit of history, really, because um, what happened then was as our lockdown progressed, we got more and more serious about activity, our activities. We started uh, conducting more and more work. 
We added a lot of people to the organization. We studied the intercountry differences in epidemics, um, locating the causes and trying to assess whether lockdowns were at all effective. Uh, short story, they aren't. And after months of this, uh, we realized that it wasn't about the science. This was all about the politics and that the only thing that was going to move the South African government was pressure from abroad. So we started internationalizing our, our organization, the name of which is Panda, which is a portmanteau for um, pandemics, data and analytics. And we established a scientific advisory board. By then, we had connections with uh, Professors Gupta Bhattacharya, Kuldorf, and Professor Michael Levitt. More recently, we added uh, Sucharit Bhakti. Um, so we established a scientific advisory board and brought in a whole lot of scientists, data, data scientists, and writers into our group to uh, move our efforts abroad. Wow. Well, that's quite a story. Now, it turns out that Unfortunately, the trouble with trying to bring international pressure is that the other countries are also crazy. Now, this, the thing is, at this point, they've been so crazy that even the tiniest glimmer of common sense gets me unjustifiably excited. So, for example, over in Europe now, where they're having a so-called second wave, it's obviously less lethal than the first wave, although you can't get the hysterics even to acknowledge obvious facts like that. They just see a big mountain of cases, and that's all that matters to them. But in Spain, my understanding is that they have decided not to return to the hard lockdown that they had in the past. Uh, looks like Belgium is thinking along the same lines, that maybe we should, we're going to have to cope with this some other way. Do you think that that kind of point of view, as halting and inadequate as it is, is very, very gradually starting to take hold here and there? I'm an inveterate optimist, so I'd like to answer yes, but I don't proceed in life with the uh, assumption that things are going to pan out in a dandy way. Uh, so we are uh, working very hard to to make sure that this approach of, you know, the the NPIs, the restrictions left, right, and centre on liberties, costly restrictions, you know, aren't perpetuated. I mean, after 200 days, you can understand. You can you can give us a break for. Um, behaving, I would say, conservatively in this regard. Um, but we sit, because we sit in South Africa with a, a tour, an international tourism industry, which is still severely restricted. Any number of small businesses which are uh, hugely restricted, whether it's by direct restrictions on their operating operations or, or via, you know, indirect impositions of crazy PPE requirements or reporting requirements or, uh, you know, social distancing requirements. So it's really still a, a very big problem. I mean, the South African economy has been through the ringer. We've lost around two and a half million jobs out of you know, 16 and a half million. So it's 15% reduction in formal employment in a country of 60 million people. It's really serious stuff. The, the government's incapacitated. Um, so it's a, a tragic story. And we just had our state of emergency, state of disaster, I beg yours, our state of disaster renewed uh, again on the, uh, yesterday uh, for, I think, the seventh time. What's the number of deaths you guys have had? The official number is around 17,000. I mean, the usual story includes a lot of deaths with rather than deaths from. Um, and there's been a, a, a slew of excess mortality over and above the official COVID deaths, which we attribute to the lockdown itself with the, all the denial of service that went on during our very, very harsh early stage of our lockdown. Let's talk about that, that paper that you say you guys wrote. Is that something we can read on your website? Yeah, the website's got all our papers. We've published several. I mean, the first one was really a simple exercise in uh, using, as I said, insurance mathematics. Just do the calculation. You know, if you take people's income away, what, what happens? And in this context, I, I guess I'd point out to your listeners that South Africa is an emerging economy and a, a developing economy. And what that means is that you have a huge mass of people who sit in, in a position in society that you can describe as only slightly above poverty. So if you start beating up their incomes, they slip down into very difficult situations very quickly. And that has a mortality consequence all of its own. And so we performed calculations using, you know, reverse engineering standard insurance mathematics. You know, when you, when you uh, write an insurance policy, you've got to have a look and see what, what uh, income the person has. That's been done for more than 100 years. And you factor that into the mortality calculation. 
Now, you can reverse that calculation and make it flow in the other direction and go from the, the economic change in economic impact to change in mortality. We performed such calculations, triangulating on the answer from a couple of directions, and came up with an estimate that the mortality consequences of the lockdown would exceed the, ex the then expected mortality consequences of the epidemic by a factor of 30. So it, was a, it really was a no-brainer lockdown from a cost-benefit analysis, a, a purely utilitarian perspective, was a non-starter. And then we did another paper where we took all the data in the world, um, really, you know, all of the epidemic data, and then we scraped left, right, and center for uh, looking for factors to explain this observation that there are these absolutely stark differences from one country to the next in mortality. And we found the standard answers that would surprise nobody. Age makes a big difference. Comorbidity prevalence makes a small difference. Obesity as a standalone factor makes a difference. Obesity prevalence. But pretty much everything else we looked at was not explanatory, not associated, and therefore not causal. And we were quite surprised at that point when we did the analysis to find that lockdown, it, it wasn't that it had a small effect. It had no effect at all, even the, the suggestion of a a negative effect on COVID mortality. We, were, we weren't expecting that. We were actually expecting there to be some benefit, but the numbers don't lie. And that, that analysis has since been repeated by researchers in Sweden and the UK. They've copied our technique and come up with exactly the same answer. So, you know, we, we, had, we had observed already, I will say this, that these profound effects that the modeling teams expected from lockdown were definitely not visible. And that was a finding you could make in March. You know, you expect there to be what's in statistics, what in statistics is called a regime change where the epidemic distribution is shifted as you enter or leave lockdown or change its, uh, its severity. And there've been obviously hundreds of such events worldwide. And whichever one you look at, there's no discernible positive benefit from implementing a lockdown and there's no discernible negative impact when you release them. Um, and that was, as I say, really evident for early, from the early countries that triggered in Western Europe. You could see it already then, but it's since played out all over the world. Lockdowns simply do nothing. You first reached out to me after I ran an episode with a guy named Gret Glyer, who runs a uh, philanthropy app called DonorSea. And he spent three years of his life living in Malawi. He's an American kid. Yeah. A kid. He's probably, maybe he's 30 now, but yeah. he was talking to me specifically about how hard the poorest countries would be hit. Now, I, I understand your point about the state of South Africa, but there are far poorer countries, even in South Africa, where there are regimes that have wanted to lock down, where the, the consequences would be still more catastrophic. It's insanity. I mean, in those countries, they've got very young populations. And I mean, the really salient feature, as you, you, you know, uh, about the coronavirus epidemic is there's a thousandfold difference in mortality between the very old and the young. And so if you've got a country where the, you know, the life expectancy is in the, in, in the 50s, you, you don't have a massive group of old or severely comorbid people. You know, the way I've expressed this in the past is that all the susceptible people in those countries are already dead. Um, so they will have a very light COVID disease burden. And to shut their economies down is, is genocide. Uh, there's no welfare system. Um, and the, the, the stories are just stomach churning, just terrible tragedy. You know, uh, you take people who are in any event living just above subsistence level or at subsistence level, and then you start trying to restrict their mobility. It's really profoundly negative. And these things, I mean, the Wealth Health Organization should know better. They do disease burden studies all the time. And what is a disease burden study? You're trying to look at the impact of a disease on an economy, you know. Very easy matter to reverse the direction of that uh, study and go from impact on economy to disease burden, you know. And they simply didn't do those calculations, even though, know, even though they know very well how to. And, you know, it, it, for me, it's just a, it's just a, absolutely mind-blowing disgrace that the World Health Organization didn't come out very early on and say, listen, our standard science, our standard approach to quarantining the healthy is that you simply don't do it. And those were the World Health Organization rules up until January this year. And also the policies of the CDC and many other health uh, authorities 
you know, we don't do quarantining of the healthy. And they should have come out strongly in the beginning and said, this is not the way to go. But they didn't. And in fact, they did the, the exact opposite. They praised these developing nations that launched hard lockdowns and in fact put a set of rules in place, a set of six rules, each of which in our estimation is, a, is an impossible target to meet in, in, in the case of a, a widespread contagion like COVID, you know, very mild general background uh, prevalence that's very high. And they put these rules in place that countries should meet in order to release their lockdowns. More recently, there's been a little bit of ambivalence with uh, David Nabarro coming out and saying, it's the last thing you should do. But it's all a little bit, bit late. Um, and there were very strange things for us when the envoy was in New Zealand telling New Zealand that it shouldn't entertain a hard lockdown. There was an envoy visiting South Africa and they said nothing. And so we've continued with our state of disaster and a milder but nonetheless present lockdown. You know, much of what I do is aimed at persuading people of various things. And the presumption behind such a mission is that it's possible to persuade people if you employ reason and, mm -hmm. and you make the strongest argument you can. And this phenomenon that I've lived through, the most bizarre phenomenon of my lifetime, observing the lockdowns and people cheering the lockdowns, mm -hmm. cheering the destruction of their own lives and livelihoods, and being upset if anyone complains about it, makes me think it's, it's almost not worth trying. That if, if mankind is this absolutely hopeless, then maybe the strategy should be protect yourself, protect your family. If everybody else wants to ruin their lives, they've made their decision. And I hate to hear myself say that, but I don't know what else to conclude from this. I refuse to believe people are acting in good, good faith here because they're, they're not even listening to the other side. Yeah. And, and the other side, which is us, is stating things that are so obvious that should be crystal clear to people and they won't listen and they carry on in the most destructive public policy in world history. And they do so while preening about their moral superiority. It just makes me think, okay, you know what? Then you people deserve to have your lives ruined. If you're going to cheer for that, you deserve it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, what, what this whole story is really laid bare is the profound commercial and scientific illiteracy of populations everywhere. You know, it's not just a developed world problem um, or sorry, not just a developing world problem. Even in developed nations, you've got the chorus of people who are seemingly oblivious to the realities of economy and science. And this whole story that that people on our side of the table are the ones who are not following the science and need to be cancelled and shouted down is itself a manifestation of a poor understanding of science. You know, the, the scientific method proceeds by conjecture and refutation. If you're not allowed to make conjectures, then there is no science. And I, I see it as a very complex phenomenon and uh, arrival point. We have uh, for decades observed our universities being taken over by postmodern thinkers, critical theory types, for whom reason itself is not something they, they really care to tangle with. And for, for whom the whole world is written in terms of power structures. And I think they look upon people who disagree them, with them as people who need to be beaten down. Uh, that's how the game is played. And so you get the censorship and the, the restrictions on free speech, these rules uh, against contesting the World Health Organization or an, any national health institute and so on. And so it's, it's a real brew, uh, a history of very bad philosophy going on at the universities and very bad science as well on the back of that, I think. Um, and then also just a, a degree of illiteracy in, in the population and an ineptitude on the account of the politicians. I, I don't think they're, for the most part, trying to do harm, but they are certainly inept. At the, at the very least, they're inept. Also that they would portray themselves as the ones following science when their yeah. analysis is preposterously simplistic. They're not even going to consider that there might be consequences to what they do outside of the COVID world. They're not even going to consider that there are trade-offs, that, that the world is slightly more complicated than their one event model. <laughs> the one event is COVID. And then the response is and supposedly anti-COVID. I'm not even convinced that they're doing a good job of that. 
and there's no sense that there might be, you shut the world down and then you bring it back and then shut it down and then threaten that you might shut it down again. You're destroying societies everywhere and, and it doesn't occur to you, maybe I should consider what the consequences of destroying society might be. It, it's it's unbelievable. And then to have them lecture you yeah. about being unsophisticated is the real kicker. Now, you have what you call the PPE of lockdown, but by PPE, you're referring to politics, philosophy, and economics. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, talk to me about that. Well, as I say, I, I mean, we, we, we locate it all in, in very bad philosophy of science. I mean, this whole idea that you sort of, you know, throw out uh, a model and then don't make the slightest effort to check whether the, the model's assumptions dovetail with reality. And when they don't, you, you claim that the difference was because of the fantastic, um, you know, rain dance that you did, the lockdown or the mask wearing, the wearing of, wearing of cloth masks or whatever the case may be. That, that sort of breakdown in scientific method is, is very basic and it, it's, it's poor philosophy of science going on, you know. Uh, we describe it as a very empiricist approach where you go, well, there's not enough data yet, so we can't, we can't do that kind of analysis, no data. Or, or, or to use the World Health Organization's classic line, there is no evidence that, you know. <laughs> That's how they seem to start off every observation they make about the epidemic, which, which is itself just, you know, just a profoundly bad way of going about things. What you do is you make the most logical or, or sensible conjecture you can, and the most creative conjecture, the one that seems to fit as much of the observations that you have, and you proceed from there, trying to falsify it and improve your explanations. But these guys kind of just made things up. Their models are like uh, ant farms. You know, they're just complete whimsical trips with parameters sucked out of the sky. And, you know, in our case, our modelers overestimated the hospital demand by a factor of 20. Uh, and that was three months in. So the, the initial model was even worse. They were probably 100 times, you know, two orders of magnitude out. And then after correcting came down to 20 times out. And you can imagine the squandering of resources that went on as everybody scrambled trying to generate enough hospital beds and build field hospitals and so on. And none of them were occupied. None of them were utilized. They got the peak of the epidemic wrong. I mean, we had this fantastic situation where we went in. We were actually invited into the, the government, government's modeling symposium. And we were very pleased. It was in May, so months ago. And we made our points. We said, you guys are using infection fatality rates that are too high. You're assuming susceptibility that's four or five times more than what's observed in the wild. And, you know, the consequences are going to be dramatic overestimates. And we made our points very clearly. They were reported in national newspapers and, and in other media. And we thought, okay, at least we've been heard now, you know, to be invited into such a symposium. Uh, you'd expect that you'd be listened to. But a few days later, the, the modelers came out with a model that was actually even worse in terms of how wrong it was. And they, we also said to them, listen, your peak is in the wrong place. These, these epidemics, when they get going, ramp up very quickly and then drop off very quickly. And they came out with the model that uh, instead of peaking where we were thinking it would peak and where it actually did peak, which was in July for South Africa, they were projecting a peak in October and resourcing for the purpose and locking down for the purpose. So there is a real um, story of, of bad philosophy of science going on. Not, they don't absorb explanatory science. Um, they take a very uh, data-first, explanation-later kind of approach, which in my mind went out in the 19th century. So that's the first problem. And then there's the politics, which I think you've captured very well. I couldn't improve on, on your explanation, Tom. Um, there's, there's, there's a kind of tribal violence game that is played, a suppression of free speech of the other side rather than engagement in the world of ideas. And I think the economics, well, you need to look much further than people who believe in monetary theory or, you know, literally printing money to solve the problem of not, not producing anything. It makes no sense. You know, we, we're talking about intellectual midgets who are proposing these things. But it's, uh, the, way, the way I look at it is there's, there's a narrative. Um, and then the narrative is, there's a new virus. It's a deadly virus. Um, we're all susceptible to it. If we don't lock down or, and wear masks, we're all going to die. Even when you're recovered, you can get it again. And even if you have an asymptomatic case, you can have long-term effects. And so it's a chain of 10 or 12 statements. And the astonishing thing about it is it's not that there's one weak link in the chain. Every single last element of that chain is totally incorrect and contradicts the science. And that is just the astonishing thing here. 
The whole story is bogus. From beginning to end, every little step is bogus. And the real story, what is it? We've got a relatively mild virus for the most part of the population. In fact, milder than the flu for most people. Slightly more severe for the very old. It's not a new virus, and therefore, you know, it's an individuum of an existing virus, not a new species. And therefore, we have T cell immunity that protects many people in the population. If you if you get it, your B cell and T cell memory kicks into action and gives a protective effect that lasts for a long time. There's nothing exceptional about the disease in terms of long-term effects relative to other diseases that we live with very happily. Well, not happily maybe, but uh, live with consistently and without locking down and wearing masks. So the whole story, every single element is, is untrue. And then at the end of it all, you, you, when you complain about the, the effects on the economy and, and what damage that does to people's lives, livelihoods, um, they turn around and say, don't worry, we'll print money. You, know? you can't make it up. It's just a ridiculous fairy tale from beginning to end. What can the general public do to help your mission? Well, we're, we're, we're um, organizing very rapidly. So you're adding people all the time. So we, we reach out continually to people who are on our side of the story and who have something to add in terms of an ability, whether it's in data or social media or in writing. And we're adding people from countries all over the world, from the United States, from Hungary, from Argentina, from Colombia, from Switzerland, the UK. We've been, we've been in, I was on the a call today with people from Portugal who are joining the effort. Then we are looking for funding um, because that some of the, the work we do does come at a cost. So far, we've managed to do everything we've done without a cent of external funding other than uh, speakers' fees. I was charging very modest speakers' fees to you know, talk to corporates and uh, private organizations. So you know, our, our, we, we're set in the process of setting up a crowdfunding platform. People can look out for that if they're keen to support our work. And otherwise, just generally boosting us on social media. Um, I'm on Twitter. Nick Hudson CT is my handle. And we, our organization's Twitter handle is Pandata19. That's also our Facebook handle. So just uh, amplifying the voice on Twitter. We're also a very open organization. We, we've been helped along by people who've seen us making the odd little error. And we're, we're not in the dig in and and batten down the hatches kind of mindset, we will simply change our explanations the moment we realize we've been wrong. So anybody who sees our commentary going adrift, you know, that uh, we, we like to hear from them. And then also I would ask people to support the Great Barrington Declaration and our three uh, advisory board members, um, Professors Gupta, Kuldorf, and uh, Bhattacharya. They're, they're doing enormous work right now. It's grueling. They're on 24-7 uh, interview uh, duty, it would seem. Um, yeah. And uh, I think they're doing a great job. And th th their role here is extremely important. If we are to re regain the territory of open science, it's people like them who need to be backed. And Professor Levitt. They've been very brave in standing up in institutions that are probably not too comfortable with the views they're taking, and certainly in, in, in a profession that's dead against them. And people like that, you've got to take your hat off to them and, and really come out and support them, I think. You know, talk to politicians, talk to your uh, local organizations. I mean, we're doing two things to help in that regard. We've got a, a network going called Panda Doctors. And so if there are any medical people listening, you know, their membership of this organization would be great. The idea is to support doctors who are speaking out against the malarkey. And we've set up another network called Panda Lawyers designed to support those doctors who are often the victim of um, attacks, legal attacks, or attacks through their professional institutions. You know, pro bono work from these lawyers will go a long way to helping these guys because they're often clueless when it comes to responding to such actions. They're, it's not, they're, they're not familiar with their own professional codes, and there often are ways to defend them. And we, we, we've had to do that in, in our own country. You know, we've come under attack from our own professions, and I've had to uh, very, have had very strong uh, support from a local law firm in addressing those. And it's, without that, we would have been shut down. But once you learn how to do it, once you learn what the tricks of the other side are and how to respond to them, you can, you can help people. You know, the technology is portable. And so we're doing that already. We're helping uh, doctors in other countries with uh, the little fixes they get into when they say such things as T cells exist or, you know, we have immune systems. And so those two networks, Panda Doctors and Panda Lawyers, are in need of support. If uh, you know any 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 uh, 
growth in membership is good because there's some safety in numbers. And uh, we think that's part of the battle here is to just get uh, a large enough voice, a large enough body of people behind us so that we become a voice that has to be listened to. Tell people the website. Our website at the moment is www.pandata.org.za. We will be coming out with an international version of that in the next few days, but you know, you're safe going to that link, pandata.org.za, and our Twitter handle uh, and Facebook handle, pandata19, so the number 19, pandata, P-A-N-D-A-T-A, 19. And yeah, follow us, uh, contribute to the effort. All right, well, I'm going to link to, I'll put that, on the show notes page, put the social media link and then also the link gbdeclaration.org for the Great Barrington Declaration. I'll put all that at tomwoods.com slash 1758 for people's convenience. Well, thank you, uh, Nick, for your time and for doing this. I mean, there's no, no one's requiring it of you. You're doing it because you're one of what turns out to be the, a much smaller number of sensible people in the world than we thought existed, but you are one of them. And you have a sense of mission and duty, and, and we're grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us on the show, Tom. It's, it's great to get the exposure, and um, yeah, really has been fun talking to you. Thank you. All right, folks, I have plenty of non-virus material for you this week. I've got Thaddeus Russell tomorrow, then uh, the very interesting Mark Crispin Miller on Thursday. He's on the left, and he's got an interesting story about academic freedom. But also, when I looked at his background, I realized I have a lot in common with this guy, even though he is on the left. He's on the old style left that I almost pine for these days. And I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation. Then Friday, I haven't run this by him yet, but I am hopeful that Lou Rockwell will want to return for another presidential debate analysis episode. So a lot of stuff to come. Most of it non-COVID, I'm happy to say. So make sure you subscribe over at tomwoods.com slash Apple, and I'll see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.